must sever the connection hinge! Now! Not until you're up here. There is no time wrecker. Plan 99. Does Dave just have something against season 2 finales? A fallen hero that we don't see clearly die on screen, but heartbreaking all round, with a long stretch before revealing an answer, and a situation that leaves our protagonists in a dark place with a vengeful follow up immediately the next season. I've got your fucking number Dave, I see you. As far as subversions go though, this one truly got me. I don't think it was on everyone's bingo card and speculation station or theorising that could have even predicted the fucking bombshells that we were hit with in this one. You didn't see that coming. However, I will say it cleverly recontextualises the events of the entire season and specifically what was done with our fallen hero and a surprising addition to the family. We pick up right where we left off, where Tech makes a run across the rail to restart the power in a rather tense exchange of fire between the crew and the TKs, the latter of which gets an assist in the air who begin to shoot out the rail cart supports and the back half starts to detach. As Tech gets the power up he makes his way back across the line and before they can get moving, the back half half breaks off. The ricochet effect rattles Tech, who topples off of it, but as he falls, he manages to lodge a cable into the cart and suspend himself in the air. <laughs> the attacks keep coming however, and as the tension builds, the music drops out, with Wrecker clinging to the rear cart for dear life, as Tech realises they'll all die if the cart doesn't release. <laughs> Wrecker and Omega plead with him, but Tech leaves us with the line When have we ever followed orders? and shoots the carriage free, beginning to plummet with the car into the woodlands below. This sacrifice reattaches the remaining car and Echo jets them off at such a speed they crash through the landing bay on the other side and awaken in the carnage with all but Echo sustaining injuries. They get off world and make it back to Old Mantel for a medical assist from AZ. We wake up from Omega's perspective who has her fears confirmed that Tech is indeed gone and Hunter sits down with her and explains what they could try and do next in an attempt to comfort Omega. Whilst this happens, Wreck wanders off with Sid who offers her condolences though she begins to start looking around rather suspiciously. Wrecker catches on to this and Sid explains that they left her no choice and that they have now brought the Empire to her doorstep. Oh, shit! She knew the crew were going to bounce and she wanted the last laughs, so she figured fuck it, I'll make one last score off them. As this is revealed, a group of commandos fly in and try to take down Wrecker and quickly go after Hunter and Omega. Hunter gets Omega out of there with AZ, who decide to double back and try and assist them in another way. As Hunter makes it to the bar, he's greeted by Hemlock, who presents Tex goggles from the crash site. You dick! claiming that that's all they could recover. Hunter is then arrested alongside Wrecker and Omega catches them off guard outside. After some back and forth however, Scorch just poochies in the frame and takes out Omega. Fuck. As Hemlock leaves Hunter and Wrecker behind, my man of the hour Echo steps in, pulling a BB-8 and takes out the security around them. They then quickly try to make it to Hemlock's ship in time, but miss him by an inch. And as they're getting onto the Marauder, Hunter is promising that they will find her as they jettison away from Old Mantel, and that they will do whatever it takes. To round out the season, we close on Omega arriving on Mount Tantus and is met with Nalase. Omega is then asked to comply and is brought to a room full of clones that are being tested on, where she finds Crosshair and is met with Emery Carr, who reveals herself to be a clone and a sister of Omega. <laughs> what? I swear to Jeebus, this episode almost got me fucking drinking again. The ups, the downs, the side to sides have all left me exhausted, but excited for what comes next. Amidst all the chaos, a foundation has been built heading into season 3, where we now have a firm direction narratively, a focused plot, a viable villain, and a needle moving moment that progresses our protagonists in the most effectual way. And that is what I think people wanted from this series, and whilst I was happy to see where the ride would take us, it's nice to know that our crew are chasing something for once. It's just unfortunate that now they will be without one of their own. 
I won't lie, this did leave me a bit angry by the end, but thankfully I've had some time to collect my thoughts and compile a list of talking points that I feel are worth mentioning for this portion of the video. So if you're still here, adjust your hearing to this shit accordingly and let's go. As it should have been throughout, this discussion needs to start with tech. The fallout from losing one of the biggest assets to the group is undoubtedly going to be harsh, uneasy and brutal going forward and could play into the crew making some questionable decisions starting out in Season 3, just as Ezra did in Rebels. We must consider that with them losing tech and that his goal in his final hours was to rescue Crosshair and the other clones, that this will remain their mission in honour of his memory alongside trying to find Omega, but underneath that will be the entire struggle from this and the anger that will settle inside. Batchers have experienced loss before and were even designed to navigate such a feeling to make them more capable on the field but nothing as personal as this. Throughout the war, they'd lost many of their brothers, but due to the bigoted stance from a lot of the regs, the question of loyalty had never cropped up for them. Whereas, if it were a reg that they liked, or one of their own, they were quick into action. Just remember how cold they were originally to rescue an Echo. They only went along with it because of the loyalty to Cody, who trusted Rex. He's out of line. I can see that Crosshair and Omega will be the driving forces for them, but tech is the motivator without a doubt. This is honestly the type of plot progression I love to see, as bad as it sounds though. This move keeps the story from stagnating as you remove a central character that people love, maintaining the investment in the series, and it sparks a new direction for the remainder of our protagonists and sets up a high-risk, high-reward situation. Not to mention what the betrayal from Sid will do to them now, likely shaking their trust in people again as she became someone that they thought they could rely on, willingly going back to her even if it was for AZ. They did stick around. I theorised for so long that her involvement wouldn't factor into any of this as I assumed assumed that Scorch would have located them long before, but she waited until now when they were at the fucking lowest before phoning it in. Piece of shit. Clever move regarding the writing by the way, to leave AZ in the background as one of the spinning plates that you just forget about until it becomes a crucial element to the plot, then that brings our group back to their biggest threat who ignites the cavalcade as shit. Very clever indeed. There's also a lot of reactions that I would like to see as you realise how vital tech was throughout this series. To name a few, you absolutely have to look at Fee, Shep, Gregor, Rex, Cody, and most importantly, Crosshair. What will Crosshair think hearing about this from Omega? The last time they met, Tech gently pointed out how he understood Crosshair's position in all this, but that he would never be on his side. Think about that motivation for Crosshair when he finds out that it was basically Tech who wanted to pursue this mission in rescuing him and the clones, and undoing any of those tainted thoughts that he might have been carrying for so long. I do think it's possible from that too that he could be the one to help lead the clones as escape now in memory of his actions and alongside Omega they stand a likely chance. Plus if they can get Emery and Nala on side the biggest threat to Mount Tantis may not actually be the Zillow Beast anymore but a unified army of intelligent, creative, competent and intuitive clones in one enclosed area. The revolution has begun. Think about that force as well, if they can swing some of the commandos, fucking watch out. Tech's death could undoubtedly spark a chain reaction of resistance against the Empire, though we have to consider the wall that they're up against, and a concerning one at that, and that is what will Hemlock go on to do with the remaining clones. The possibilities are vast, and if you think too hard on it they become quite disturbing, but there are a lot of different avenues that Hemlock could go down. For example, could they become new assassins like we saw with Clone X? Or renewed commandos? Or is it possible that they're just being lined up to become genetic scraps to fuel Palps as cloning research? All horrifying ends to a group of lives that deserve better? But I want to put something out there that might come across rather twisted, but I'm actually glad that Hemlock will be around for Season 3. The pathological masochist has been positioned as a man with few words, but greater influence than Rampart ever had. He's calculated, maniacal and devious in his own right, and clearly knows how to weaponize something. Think about how that'll look up against the clone uprising. However, there is one possible factor that we need to consider among all this tech talk, and that is, what if Hemlock was able to acquire tech? What if he was able to salvage tech from the wreckage, and he is in fact alive? What could he achieve with the smartest clone in the former Republic army? There is a possibility here that Tech could have survived, as his salvaged item was his goggles, which he would have had to remove from his face. Which, if you think about it, were underneath Tech's helmet. So, the helmet could have possibly broken off and they might have flown away, that is likely, but 
could we be looking at another Winter Soldier situation here? Don't count it out. This is a rabbit hole that I don't want to dig too far into just yet, but for now, we can choose to accept the loss of a brother, or we can keep our brains burning at the possibility that Tech is alive. If Tech is truly gone, however, and I'm following the belief that we didn't see him go on screen, then it truly recontextualizes everything he went through this season and what he did for his squad. From learning off of Romar, to helping Sid against Maligi, to his constant pairings with Fee, then attempting to help Chuchi, the clones, the orphan boys, Pabu, and then without hesitation, wanting to retrieve Crosshair, all with Omega by his side, teaching him, supporting him, getting him to open up. Tech learned the one thing he struggled to comprehend for the longest of times, and that was, in my mind, compassion and love. Hunter phrased it more as a move to protect the squad by looking at it as Plan 99, but as Omega said in Episode 9, they're a family. Tech saved his family by making the ultimate sacrifice, Sacrifice. Where this robotic little shit couldn't have made a connection between two spoons before, everything he's endured throughout the season taught him to appreciate the very motivator that made this decision for him. It's beautiful storytelling, and as is often the case, the best ones hurt the most. Speaking of recontextualizing aspects of the season to mean something different, the fuck was this? I mean, looking at all of the nods, twitches, flinches, movements, it all makes sense now. Especially her pleads with Crosshair last week, and that trepidation I pointed out in her voice, but damn was this still a surprise. I am left fascinated about Emery's inclusion now, and what this could mean for future seasons. As at no point did Nala say indicate otherwise, then again, why would she want to when the war against the Empire is being fought with more than just weapons? However, we must now ask ourselves, if she hid Emery from everyone, including Omega, what else has this woman done? And is there a possibility that Hemlock knows? Who knows, but what a truly intriguing situation this series has found itself in. Moving forward though, there's many paths that this show could go down, and there are still many clones out there that we need answers to. Like, where's Cody, and can we finally get Wolf? I doubt that we'll get anything to the degree of Pulse for next season, however, one major step up in my mind in terms of a overarching antagonist could, in my mind, be Vader. <laughs> They made a model for him in the season 7 finale of Clone Wars, I'm just saying. Though, to bring Vader in, they would need a necessary reason for his involvement that could justify such a presence, especially against a small group of defective clones. However, given the secrecy around Mount Tantus and the funding talks in the summit between Hemlock and Krennic, I think an attack on Tantus would be enough to validate his involvement. Just saying. That aside though, I do wonder what Wrecker and Hunter will be like in the next phase of this story. They are in essence the remnants of Clone Force 99, and they've been left broken, beaten, and scarred by what transpired here. And while people have seemingly wanted to label Hunter as a coward to want to go back to Pabu, you have to remember, he's just as lost in this. He wants to protect his squad, and losing tech has shaken him. Even with Echo back, the team is far from full strength. Hunter wants to keep what's remaining around him safe, and Wrecker has retreated inside himself for now, but I can see them dropping all pretenses in the next season as they prepare to go on the hunt for their family. Not to mention again, we've got Echo back, and given the strength and bond that he developed with Omega throughout the season, and that visible upset he had looking over at Tech's chair on the Marauder, he's not going to let this one go. Looking back over the season, I think this was a more disjointed outing than the first, and it was certainly more expansive in terms of its world building and characters, more ambitious in its writing and animation, and its strike to push things forward for the wider narrative whilst trying to balance those personal journeys for our team, but overall, I feel it succeeded in being a worthy successor to both the Clone Wars and its first outing. I loved this final episode as much as I hated it, but it was a tense, bold, consequential, and heavy exchange that moves things along effectively without feeling devoid of intention. Everyone delivered for this, including Michelle Ang, and I'm left brimming with joy at the fact that we're gonna get a third season. That's it from me though everyone, thank you so much for tuning in week to week for these reviews. If you like this, please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe for more Star Wars content from me down the road, including finishing off Mando Season 3, and other reviews just like this, and until next season everyone, take care and may the force be with you.